Welcome to Bible Believers Fellowship and part two of our two-part study of Revelation chapter 8 verses 1 through 6 titled Seventh Seal, Seven Trumpets. We will see that a familiarity with the Old Testament tabernacle and temple is required in order to understand the many references in the book of Revelation to things like altars, candles, incense, and the throne which we identify in our study. We urge the Bible believer to practice what you profess. If you believe the Bible, then you ought to read it cover to cover. Only in this way will you ever grow in your knowledge of the book and in your understanding of God's words and of His will for your life. And now we begin our study of Revelation chapter 8, part 2 of 2, covering verses 1 through 6, Seventh Seal, Seven Trumpets. You see, in the temple, the, the throne was the mercy seat. The cherubim faced the mercy seat. And when the glory of God appeared in the temple, it was on the mercy seat. God on His throne in the temple was on the mercy seat. And so that's what you, you're picturing there. Now, I know people who have read Revelation and read Revelation and had no idea when they read that verse and many others like it, that they were seeing parallels to the temple. And then they wonder why they don't understand Revelation. That's a clear uh, parallel. Now, here's why we know this. Back in the book of Hebrews, in chapter 8, verses 4 and 5 say this, For if he were on earth, he talk about the priest, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law. It's talking about Jesus, if he were on earth, he would, that we already had priests at this time. Verse 5, Who serve, these priests on earth, serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things. See, when you read about the temple, it makes it more interesting if you understand that what you're reading about is based on something in heaven. There's a temple in heaven. It continues and says, As Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle, for see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern. Blueprint. The pattern showed to thee in the mount. Did you ever think about it like that? Moses was up on the mount and God rolled out the blueprints. We have an engineer in the room. He knows what I'm talking about. Roll those blueprints out and he said something paraphrasing here, but Moses, this is what I want you to build. He said, you go back and read it, he said, make sure you follow the blueprint exactly because this is a pattern of a heavenly thing. Do you remember why Moses didn't enter into the promised land? Do you remember? Why? Somebody tell me. Because he struck the rock, he struck it twice, what was he supposed to do? Speak to the rock. You see, God was showing provision by grace and Moses made it of works. God was showing that Jesus is the rock from whom the water of life would spring and Moses destroyed the picture in disobedience. And that's why it was so important. Everything God told Moses, it's just like your ki kids, you know, sometimes your parents will say, go do this. You should just do it. I mean, there's, you don't turn around and say, I want an explanation as to why, or I'm not doing it. And your parent, if they're good parents, going, get your scrawny little butt out there and do it now. <laughs> why? You don't ask questions. Now, if you do and you obey, there's nothing wrong with you know saying, well, now, Father, now that we have done this, <laughs> could you please explain to me the rationale behind it? <laughs> A lot of kids have gotten hurt 
and even killed because they didn't listen to their parents. Their parents had to explain. And since it was an emergency situation and the parent didn't have time to explain, the kid ends up hurt or killed. It's the same way with God. Listen, there isn't always going to be a grand explanation why you do this or why you do that. But you do it. Why? Because God's Word is proven true. You know you can trust God. God cannot lie. God will not lie. When God says, don't do it this way because I said so, just don't do it that way. Do it His way. And in the long run, you'll figure it out. You know, this whole culture we're in right now is, oh, you don't need to get married. Oh, you, you know, same sex, that's the same as anything else. It's love, 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 love. You know, we don't need to do it God's way. We can do it our own way. We, after all, this is the 21st century. Think about how dumb that is. What does the date have to do with right and wrong? This is the 21st century. And? How does that change anything? You know, if you stuck your finger in a light socket in 1945, you died. If you stick your finger in a light socket today, 2012, what do you do? You die. You're not going to walk in, stick your finger in a light socket, and be going, it's the 21st century. The calendar doesn't change things. So we follow, just like Moses, we follow the pattern given to us in the Word of God because God said so. And that's why we know that what we're reading in Revelation is based on something in heaven because God says so. Now, I'm getting to a point here. You have a lot of teachers who are trying to talk you out of believing that. There are a lot of teachers who will tell you that there is no tabernacle in heaven and that it wasn't really based on a real pattern of a tabernacle. And I'm just here to tell you, God said there is. <laughs> and so I'm going to believe and teach that there is. Amen? Amen. Amen? Amen. So, the heavenly temple and the seventh seal had these things in common. The golden censer, the incense, the golden altar, the throne, which is the mercy seat, and seven. Seven seals, seven trumpets. Now look at what you find in Leviticus 16, 11 through 14. You don't have to turn there, but you can if you want. You read Leviticus without reading the rest of the Bible, it is boring. I'm just being honest with you. You read the book of Leviticus without reading the rest of the Bible, it will bore you to death. You read Leviticus and read the other 65 books, just like we just read in Revelation. Then you go back to Leviticus and all of a sudden you see the reality. You see the things matching up. How many of you ever worked on a puzzle? You ever worked on a puzzle? And until you start to actually see some things coming together, it's really aggravating. It's like, oh yeah, this goes here. And then you try to put the next piece and you're like, ugh, ugh. And yet you've done that. You've been there. And then all of a sudden though, you find the corner pieces and then you get a little bit more and then it starts to go together. That's exactly what Bible study is like. If you're aggravated with Bible study, it's just because you need to read the whole thing, the big picture. If you try to just match up pieces of the puzzle, you never get there. But if you go back and you look at the big picture and you look for the corner pieces and you look for this and that, it starts to go together. Leviticus chapter 16 is a corner piece. Verse 11 says, And Aaron, the high priest, who's your high priest? Jesus. Jesus. Aaron was the high priest, shall bring the bullock of the sin offering. Who's our sin offering? Jesus. Jesus. Which is for himself. So Aaron brought a bullock as an offering for himself. Jesus, the high priest, is the sin offering in the New Testament continues, and shall make an atonement for himself. Well, Jesus gave himself. Continues, and for his house. And that's the believers. And shall kill the bullock of the sin offering which is for himself. Now watch this. Verse 12. 
And he shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from off the altar before the Lord, and his hands full of sweet what? Incense, just like in Revelation. Beaten small and bring it within the veil. Verse 13, and he shall put the what? Incense upon the fire before the Lord that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat, which is the throne. That is upon the testimony, the ark that he die not. Verse 14. Read that with me. And he shall take of the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it with his finger upon the mercy seat eastward. And before the mercy seat shall he sprinkle of the blood with his finger. What? Seven times. Seven seals. Seven trumpets. Seven times. It's an amazing book, people. Just goes together like a puzzle. Amen? This is a quote from Noah Hutchings in his book. He said that this is just a, an interesting current event fact. The Temple Institute, you know what that is? There's a group of Orthodox Jews in Israel who are preparing for a temple in Israel. And they say the Temple Institute is restoring the temple furniture for future worship when the temple is restored. The golden altar of incense is one of the items that is now ready. You can actually go over there and see the furniture that's already been prepared to use in a temple in Israel. Why are they going to have a temple? Because they still reject their Messiah. Daniel 9, 24-27. He was cut off, but not for himself. Go back and read that. But there's coming, after they cut the Messiah off, there is a gap. And there's still one week left. Daniel's 70th week. Hadn't happened yet. And when it happens, there'll be a temple. There was a temple in the previous 69 weeks of Daniel. There'll be a temple in the 70th week. That temple will have blood sacrifice because they haven't received the blood sacrifice of their Messiah, Jesus. And the Antichrist will commit the abomination of desolation and go in and stop the sacrifice. And that'll be in the mid point of the 70 weeks and that's when everything really cuts loose and they are already preparing for that they have the furniture and everything ready to go and uh, that's one now I want to mention this we talked about the heavenly temple and it being a pattern of what was brought to, down to this earth but don't get mixed up on this there's a phrase how many of you have heard this as above so below you heard that mm -hmm. that is an occult phrase and that is a, it, it isn't a biblical idea of the temple in heaven coming to the earth in the tabernacle and then Jesus himself tabernacling among men. This is a reference to astrology and the idea that the stars control what's going on on the earth. It's a ripoff of the reality. The stars do not dictate events. God's plan dictates events. We see what's going on in the world. We see what's going on in Israel. And sadly, some Christians get a little unwound about it. And like, wait a minute. You don't have anything to be worried about here. God's in control. <laughs> God's going to take care of business. Yes, sir. We watch. Some Christians like to, you know, ostrich thing. Put their head in the sand just don't care. We're not to be ostriches. We're to be sheep. Amen? Amen. Amen. We're to be aware. We're, I would not have you to be ignorant brethren. So we look around and we see what's going on but we aren't shaken by it. We know God is in control. We're watching because it's a faith-building exercise. You see the stage is set. You can see the fingerprint of God. When you see Israel back in their land in unbelief, Zechariah 12.10 says there'll be an unbelief. When Jesus returns in the sky, they will look upon Him whom they pierced and they will mourn and they will cry. Why? Because up until that point, Israel's in unbelief. But you have, I'm sorry, just being honest, ignoramus Christians today running around saying, those Jews over in Israel aren't the real Jews. They don't even receive Jesus. You're like, duh. <laughs> That's what the Bible says will happen. The Jews go back to Israel in unbelief and they stay there and they, they accept a false Messiah. 
and they have a temple and they're still offering blood sacrifice right up to the very end when Jesus returns. And then they look and all of a sudden they mourn. And that talks about it like a, from the depths of their soul crying out with grief because they realize they and their ancestors have been rejecting the true Messiah all along. That's the fingerprint of God. You're seeing it right before your eyes. Verse 4, read that with me. And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. Now this is a visual, and you kind of think, how does that whole work, thing work? You know, it's incense, prayers, rising up before God. Well, Revelation 6.10, there's these prayers. And what you're about to see next gives you a little bit of explanation to it. You have the incense and the prayers going up before God. Those prayers were in Revelation 6. We already read them. The prayers were, and they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? Those are the prayers. They're calling on God to avenge. Now, that's not you. <laughs> that's not your prayer. So don't steal it and pray it against the guy you work with that you don't like. <laughs> These are tribulation saints who have been killed by people who can't be saved. You understand that? Mm -hmm. These are people who have taken the mark of the beast. They're gone. The Bible says you take the mark of the beast, you worship the beast, you're gone. So they're praying against people who can't be saved. When the guy you work with you don't like, you should be praying for him to be saved. He, he hasn't taken any, any mark. He's still, as far as we know, I mean, he, we were talking about that today. There are reprobates, but you and I don't know who they are, so we just obey the Lord, preach the gospel, pray for our enemies, and that sort of thing. Be kind to them, heaping coals of fire on their head. It's funny, I remember in a youth group, uh, I used to be a youth minister, which I totally oppose now. <laughs> but uh, at the time, you know, I didn't know any better. I'm teaching these young people. And I had this kid saying, I don't care. I know I'm not supposed to do anything, but I'm going to get back at him. And I'm just going to, you know, and I sat him down. I said, you know, there's a better way of getting back. Really? I said, yeah. The Bible describes it like having coals of fire dropped on your head. He's like, what do I got to do? <laughs> I said, be nice. What? I said, just do it. Just do it. Be nice to the guy. Watch what happens. And sure enough, he started being nice to the guy. The next thing you know, I don't know if the guy felt coals of fire on his head, but they ended up being good friends. So that's the way. That's not... His prayer. I tried to tell the kid, that's not how you pray for people now. But these are tribulation saints. And they're praying about people who have taken the mark and cannot be saved. And it says in verse 5, the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar. And watch this. Cast it into the earth. Think about that. The prayers were, Dear God, Kill them. And he takes those prayers in that in the with the incense in the censer and casts them to the earth where they will be fulfilled and answered. Listen, do you know the Bible says, we may choose not to believe it, but the Bible says every murdered baby will be avenged? Do you understand that? America thinks they're going to keep killing babies and nothing's going to happen. Proverbs said, because there's slow... Uh, um, it, quote it for me. Oh, it's in Ecclesiastes. Same author, wrong book. Do you hear that? In other words, because God doesn't 
respond right now, they think they're getting by with it. How many, Cheryl? What was the last? I think since, are you talking about? Since 73 in America. Is it about 40 million? The Bible says that's just America. <laughs> yeah, that's not other countries or yeah. And Europe has probably just as many, if not more, than we. Yeah. Have. China and everywhere else. You remember when Cain slew Abel? God didn't say, "Yes, I just got this report from the FBI." Did he? Mm -hmm. What did he say? Your brother's blood is crying out from the ground. And various places through the Scripture says that. God, the Bible says the life is in the blood. You take your blood, everything about you is in that blood. Break it down to the DNA level, they can find out anything they want to on you. It speaks. When they break down the DNA, it's language, it's words, it's speaking. Your blood cries out. And the blood of the innocent is crying out. There's a payday coming. America better wake up. They're not going to get by with it. And it says there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. There's earthquakes. Periodically you'll see, and an earthquake. And an earthquake. There's various massive earthquakes taking place during this time of great tribulation. That's why Hebrews 10, 30 and 31 says, For we know... Him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge His people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. If you reject the gospel of Jesus Christ, you will fall into the hands of the living God and He will recompense. The only way to escape the vengeance of God is to accept the payment Jesus Christ provided when He took that vengeance upon Himself. He became sin, died, went into hell, then brought the captives out, preached condemnation to those who had rejected the Word of the Lord through the centuries before He came. And He paid the full price. When He died on the cross, He said, it is finished. But He was talking about the payment that would be received by faith. If you believe the Gospel, it is finished. If you reject the Gospel, it hasn't even started yet and will continue throughout eternity. That's why we read that. And then finally, verse 6. Read that with me. And the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. And that's where we're going to stop. Seven angels. The seventh seal has now set up the seven angels and those seven trumpets are about to sound. And we're going to start studying those next time, one after the other. Now, I want to repeat, as we study these next few chapters, it's, it's gloom and doom for those on the earth. But understand, that doesn't belong to the believer. The believer is saved. God didn't save you so that He could keep you long enough to beat the tar out of you for seven years. The Bible says we are His bride. I, an old preacher used to say, God's not a wife beater. Uh, there's many ways of, you know, cliches and everything else, but the Bible says that the church is removed, and after Revelation 6 to Revelation 19, there's no church. I've asked people who didn't reject that to show me, and they never can show me a church. There's no gospel of grace. It's not in there. The gospel preached in there, Revelation 14, read it. There's no born again. He, you endure to the end, you'll be saved. How do you lose salvation? In the tribulation period, you take the mark of the beast. Totally different game. Why? Because it's the last week of the Old Testament. 
How many of you know the Old Testament's not over yet? That clears, uh, yeah, it helps you understand the Bible in ways you can't imagine if you get that. The Old Testament isn't done yet. There's seven years left. There's one week. And that one week will not have a church because the previous 69 weeks didn't have a church. It will have a temple because the previous 69 weeks did have a temple. It's a totally different world. So when you read this, you're reading the future that you will be in heaven observing, but it should motivate us to preach the gospel because our time is short. Our time is short. Take advantage of the time you have to preach the gospel and reach the lost. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time in your word. And we thank you for helping us to understand, helping us to rightly divide. And we just thank you for the promise of eternal life. He that hath the Son hath life. We thank you for that so much, Lord. We thank you for the gospel of grace. 